Hello everybody, welcome to Accounting 330, Introduction to Income Taxation. This is going to be an interesting experience for myself. It's the first time I'll be teaching online. Uh, I would have loved to be in the classroom with you, but unfortunately due to COVID-19, I opted out of teaching in person. And originally I had intended this uh, to be a class where we met on Zoom and it was going to be live uh, but then I got a notification from the university that students generally prefer to watch videos on their own time uh, which is why I've decided to pre-record my lectures and go about the class this way uh, so you know generally during the first day, what we would have done would be to kind of, I would introduce myself, then get to know you a bit, but, you know, I'm hoping that I'll get to know some of you throughout the semester as we meet on Zoom for office hours and what have you. So we'll skip that and we will go straight into the administrative matter, which in this case is going to be a syllabus. Uh, so, like I said, this is Accounting 330, Introduction to Income Taxation. Uh, my name is Mehmet, and my office is on the fourth floor of CapFed, but I won't be there this semester. Uh, you could email me at mehmet at ku.edu. Uh, once again, the phone number is my office number, and as I said, I'm not going to be in the office. Uh, Office hours, I will have them on Mondays and Wednesdays from 1 to 5 p.m. And we can meet at this Zoom ID. So Mehmet Kara is how you can find me. Uh, between those times on Mondays and Wednesdays, I will be on Zoom waiting for you in that room. And if you have any questions, you know, if you just want to chat, uh, you can log into Zoom and hop on to that meeting ID and <clears throat> you know if there's more than one of you I'll put some of you in a waiting room and that's how we'll hopefully navigate the office hour uh, generally I only had office hours for three hours a week but since I'm not going to be able to be in class with you I've decided to hold office hours for the originally scheduled hours of this class so normally this class was going to be from around 1 p.m. Uh, to 5.30 p.m. for the three different sections that I had. Uh, and since we're not going to be able to meet in person, I've decided that I'll just hold office hours during the regularly scheduled class hours. And if you have questions, or like I said, if you want to chat, you can hop on at that time. So the required text is the Jones, Rhodes, Katana, and Callahan book. Uh, it's the 2021 edition. The problem with having an older edition is going to be twofold. One is tax law changes each year. Uh, so this is the book actually, right? Uh, tax law changes each year. So if you have an older edition of the book, some of the information is going to be outdated. And then also we will need to utilize some of the McGraw-Hill Connect content from this book and if you buy an older edition I don't think you'll be able to get a current McGraw-Hill Connect code that'll allow you to use all the functionality that Connect has to offer. Uh, so the prerequisite is accounting 320 with a grade or C with a grade of C or better I'm assuming that if you haven't had the prerequisite met you wouldn't be able to sign up for the class anyway. Course description, this course is an introduction to the role of taxes in society, including current tax policy and proposals for reform, and the impact of taxes on individuals and business entities. It is designed to provide students with the knowledge and skills required to successfully evaluate the specific income tax implications of various fact situations. And by the end of this course, you should be able to apply basic tax rules and regulations to compute taxable income and tax liability for individuals incorporate tax costs and tax savings into calculations of the net present value of cash flows, 
recognize tax planning opportunities or problems inherent in common businesses and investment transactions, identify tax policy issues suggested by or underlying particular provisions of the law. So this is going to be a basic tax course. I'm going to lay down the foundation, which hopefully you'll be able to build on if you decide to take, you know, higher level classes in taxation. Uh, the course grades will be determined as follows. We're going to have four exams. Each of them are going to be graded out of 75 points. We'll have quizzes, which will make up 100 points. And then we'll have a tax return project, which will make up 100 points. So the entire class will be graded on 500 points. And looking at this breakdown, quizzes are going to make up 20% of the grade. Tax return project is going to make up 20% of the grade. And your exams are collectively going to make up 60% of the grade. All right. And we're going to get into the specifics of these <clears throat> in the next slides. Uh, so out of the 500 points, this is what the breakdown will be, right? If you get above a 90%, which is 450 points or above, you'll get an A. If you get above an 80%, you'll get a B, and so on and so forth. So there will be four exams. Uh, the exams won't be cumul cumulative. Uh, however, we will be building on material that we've learned previously. So there's like a quasi-cumulative nature to the exams. Each exam is not independent from the previous exam just because of the way the knowledge you acquire is built on what you've learned previously. Uh, they will be taken online. Uh, they will be closed book and closed note. I'm debating on whether or not I should utilize certain software that kind of locks you in, locks your browser and has your webcam on, or if we should just have the exams on Zoom. Because previously the exams were scheduled uh, evenings of non-class nights, so I think they were like on Tuesday nights or Thursday nights and everyone was going to be in the room taking the exam together. So maybe we could do something similar where everyone gets on Zoom, I split you into individual breakout rooms, and you just take the exam that way. Uh, that way I could just hop into the breakout room to check in on you, or if you have a question, you could ask a question, and I could come into the breakout room. Uh, but I'm debating on whether I go that way, or we just use some sort of, you know, online browser uh, system. If you miss an exam, you need to contact me before the exam, and it needs to be for valid reasons, right? So you can't miss an exam for vacations, weddings, work needs, and car trouble. Since we'll be taking the exams online, I, uh, you know, not all of these would be applicable, but if you do have an exam, and there is a valid reason why you must miss the exam, you need to let me know beforehand. Uh, quizzes, there will be 11 quizzes. Uh, one of them will be dropped, your lowest quiz grade, and there will be no credit given for missed quizzes. So you can miss one of them, it won't affect your grade, and since quizzes overall make 100 points, that means that each quiz individually is going to make up 10 points, right? Uh, generally, the way quizzes will work is there will be a chapter that we cover in class over the course of, you know, two videos or one video or multiple videos, and at the end of that chapter, there will be a quiz associated with that chapter. Uh, in order to take the quiz, you need to be able to access McGraw-Hills Connect. So this is why the book and probably needs to be new because the book comes with a code that you can use to access the online system. Even though you'll get to the quiz through Blackboard, I will link Blackboard and Connect so that the quiz is coming from Connect and being pushed to Blackboard. Uh, the other component is the tax return project. Uh, this is just going to be a project where you compile information that I provide regarding individual taxpayers and you prepare a tax return for these individual taxpayers. 
Uh, last time I taught this class, this was a group project. I still think it would help you if it is a group project. It might make it easier, but then there's logistics, right? How do you coordinate online if it's a group project? Uh, so I'm not really sure if this will be a group project or an individual tax return. Uh, McGraw-Hill Connect. For each chapter of the textbook covered in class, I will assign a series of assessment questions and application problems through McGraw-Hill Connect. You can access these assignments from the Learn Smart and Assign Problems tab in Blackboard. None of this Connect material will be graded. However, it is a useful resource for getting more practice on the concepts covered in class. So the quizzes will be coming from Connect and those will be graded. But the uh, assessment questions that come from the Learn Smart and the Assign Problems functionalities of Connect won't be graded. Uh, so yeah, that's generally covering the graded material in class, right? So course and university policies, participation. Uh, this is going to be an asynchronous class, so this participation issue isn't really relevant. Electronic device policy, once again, this is asynchronous. You'll be watching these videos on your own time, so, you know, this also is not a relevant section. Out of class assistance, uh, I am committed to helping you succeed in this course. Uh, the office hours were listed at the top of the syllabus, uh, and since I'm not going to be able to interact with you personally in class, I'm really making myself available to you on Zoom. Uh, like I said, I will be on Zoom on Mondays and Wednesdays from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. And you can hop on to the Zoom meeting ID Mamankara. I'll be waiting for you there. If you don't come, I'll just, you know, work on other stuff. But if you come, you'll have my full attention and I can help you with, you know, any sort of project or, 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 or class content that you don't understand. If you do send an email, you know, if you have a question that you want to address through email, I request that you sent a well thought out email, right? If you send an email and ask a question, if you could like describe your thought process and some of your possible solutions, that would really help me figure out where you are, what you've already thought through, and how I can help you better. Uh, I'm pretty good with responding to emails quickly. Uh, you know, even if it's late at night or on a weekend, I generally get back to you fairly quickly on the emails. Uh, however, you shouldn't really expect email replies outside of normal business hours, right? If it's be uh, within normal business hours, then definitely I'll hop on and get you an email response as quickly as possible. I'm still pretty good about that even outside of business hours, but, you know, I do have a life and other things are going on. So I'll try to get back as quickly as possible. Uh, academic dishonesty, even though we're not in class in person, I still view academic dishonesty as a very serious offense. If you're caught cheating on assignments or exams, you know, needless to say, uh, you'll be penalized in accordance with uh, KU rules and regulations. Uh, commercial note-taking policy, you know, don't sell these videos. To other people this is for me and for you uh, so the details of the commercial note-taking policy are on the syllabus students with disabilities if you have any additional needs please contact student access services and I'm sure they will be able to provide you with any sort of assistance that you might need if there's anything that I could do for you please let me know and I'll try to accommodate any needs that you might have uh, so this is the tentative schedule for the course, right? So all of these boxes individually will represent videos. And as you can see, the first two videos will cover chapter one. And at the end of those two videos, there will be a quiz that will be due. And I'll generally notify you that a quiz is available and when the quiz is due on the video. Uh, yeah, so there's two days for chapter one, 
two videos for chapter two, two for chapter three, one for chapter four, and then the first exam will cover the first four chapters, right? And then there's four videos for chapter seven, one for chapter eight, one for chapter nine, and then the next exam will cover chapters seven, eight, and nine. Then the third exam will only cover chapter 14. This is the exam that talks about the individual income tax stuff. The class majority of our time is dedicated to corporate income tax because if you graduate and you decide to pursue a career in tax, more likely than not you'll be working with corporate income tax. However, a big portion of what professional tax people do is also individual income tax plus a lot of this will help you with your own tax work right and then the final tax uh, final exam I mean the final chapters are going to be 15 16 and 17 so you know you can watch the videos as they're posted according to your own schedule but tentatively if we were in class this is the schedule that we would be following so this is the kind of schedule that you know I would expect for you to uh, to follow as well so if you have any questions about the syllabus uh, feel free to ask um, Actually, I'm not sure if this final exam date is accurate, so scratch this out for now, and I'll get back to you with an actual final exam date. But aside from that, if you have any questions about the syllabus, please feel free to ask, send emails, what have you. And <clears throat> so that is the extent of the administrative matters uh, for the class. Let's move on to the actual content of the class. So, you know, in this class, we're going to, like I said, focus primarily on corporate taxation. Uh, I'd say about 30% of the overall material is dedicated to individual income taxation. The remaining 70 is going to be dedicated to corporate uh, income taxation. Uh, but with Chapter 1, we're really going to start and talk about some terminology that is going to be helpful and that is universal regardless of the type of taxation that we're talking about. So the first thing to talk about obviously is uh, what are taxes, right? So taxes are compulsory payments to support the cost of running a government. All right, so taxes are compulsory payments that are in place to raise revenues to help us offset some of the costs of running a government. And the key word here is compulsory. And this means that taxes are not voluntary, right? So we don't have an option of not paying taxes. Uh, we might be subject to different types of taxes depending on where we are or what activity we're involved with, but we don't have the option of not paying for these taxes. And taxes, they differ from fines or penalties because they are not a punishment for something, right? So taxes at times might feel like a punishment. We don't enjoy paying taxes, but in fact, they're not a punishment for anything, right? If you get a fine, for speeding, that's a punishment for speeding. If there are penalties in place because you were late doing something or you passed the deadline on something, that is a punishment. However, taxes are not a punishment. They're just a way for the government to raise uh, revenues. 
taxes also differ from usage fees because they don't entitle the payer to specific services or goods. So taxes are compulsory payments to the government to help offset the costs of you know running government. They differ from penalties and fines because they're not a punishment for any sort of activity or wrongdoing and they also differ from fees because they don't entitle us as taxpayers to any sort of outcomes, goods, or services, right? If you pay a Netflix membership fee, you're entitled to watch Netflix, but your taxes that you pay don't necessarily mean that you'll be getting anything from the government in return that affects you directly, right? The government can use your tax money in any way that the government sees fit, whether it's a city government or the federal government right and you know if you follow debates around tax reform one of the proposed reforms is to have you as a taxpayer determine where your tax money can be spent I mean it's logistically very cumbersome right but if you say I don't want my tax money going to I don't know let's say the military I want it funneled towards health care or education you know you don't have that option currently the government does with your tax money whatever it sees fit and so just to briefly add something here taxes generally have two properties so one is that taxes are pervasive and what does this mean this means that taxes are widespread and there are many varieties of taxes. You know, all sorts of different taxes that we as taxpayers are subject to. And the second item is taxes are dynamic. This means that they change frequently. So part of the reason why we need this edition of the textbook as opposed to an older edition is because every year there are minute changes to the tax code. And this is, you know, done to meet certain needs that might arise during that year or it's been something that's been pre-planned in the past and is just taking effect this year. But every year there are minute changes to the tax code and then every once in a while we'll have some major changes to the tax code as well like we have recently with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, or in 86, there were a lot of tax law changes. So very rarely do we have minor tax reform that really shakes things up, but generally we have very few tax law changes. Uh, so to circle back to this question, right, what, who are taxpayers? Taxpayers are any persons who are required by law to pay taxes. Now, this word persons, when we're talking about tax and taxpayers, has a different connotation because it could mean us as individuals, but it could also mean corporations or different types of business entities, right? So you are a person in the eyes of the tax authority. I am a person in the eyes of the tax authority, but also, you know, Adidas, the company, is a person. Amazon is a person. Apple is a person that is tasked with paying taxes. So, you know, when we talk about the tax authority, the, the definition of person changes from what we normally believe it to be. Uh, so, one thing that is common to all types of taxes is incidence. And what is incidence? Incidence is the ultimate burden 
of the tax, right? So the key thing with incidence is the burden may not fall on the person who pays the tax. And hopefully this example here will illustrate this a bit more. So Westeros imposes an income tax on all corporations of 20% due to budget shortfalls. Budget shortfalls. Westeros decides to increase the income tax on corporate business profits from 20% to 25%. So who bears the incidence of this tax increase, right? Initially, when you just look at this, you see that we had a corporate income tax of 20% and it was raised from 20% to 25% due to budget shortfalls, right? So you might say, well, the corporations bear the brunt of this tax increase. They bear the ultimate economic burden, so the incidence is on the corporations entirely. But if we have increased taxes on corporate profits, what are some possible outcomes or, or unintended consequences, right? On the one hand, we could have increased prices on goods or services, right? So if we have, you know, Amazon that is subject to this increased tax rate, then Amazon might decide to increase prices on their goods. Or if we have different restaurants that are subject to this increased tax rate, then those restaurants might decide to increase the prices of their menu items. So we have an increased price on goods and services as a result of the increased taxes on corporate profits. So in this case, the incidence is on the consumer, right? So then you and I would bear the burden of this tax. Now, another possible outcome is decreased dividend payments. So if you and I own shares in a, you know, in a company, we have stock of a company, that company has the option to pay out dividends. Now, not all companies pay out dividends, but assuming that companies pay out dividends, uh, this increase in the taxes of their corporate profits could decrease the probability of a dividend payout or the amount of a dividend payout. So we as shareholders might not get a dividend or we might get a lower dividend than we were expecting. So in this case, the incidence is on the shareholder, right? So as you can see, the corporate profit, uh, increase in the tax on the corporate profit, right? This is gonna be paid out by companies that operate in Westeros. However, the companies that operate in Westeros might not bear the burden of the tax. They might not get the incidence, right? The burden might be borne by consumers or shareholders in, you know, different instances. So it's not always the case that the individual or the organization that pays the tax bears the incidence of this tax. It might be the case that, you know, companies don't increase prices or they don't decrease dividends, and in that case, the company itself, who is paying the tax, would be bearing the incidence, the burden. Now, another key concept here, much like incidence, is jurisdiction. And jurisdiction is important because we would be subject to different taxation, taxes depending on which jurisdictions we are a part of. And a jurisdiction is essentially the right of a government to tax specific people or organizations. So, 
we as taxpayers are subject to various different jurisdictions. You know, we're subject to the federal jurisdiction. Uh, that's why we pay, you know, federal income tax. We're subject to a state jurisdiction. That's why we pay sales taxes in the state or, you know, some states have a state income tax. We're subject to a city level, a county level jurisdiction, and there might be different taxes associated with each level of, of, of jurisdiction, right? Uh, some jurisdictions might not exercise their right to tax, but most will. Now, jurisdictions exist because of some sort of link between the government and the taxpayer. And this link could be some sort of physical presence. This link could be economic presence. Or this link could be citizenship. Uh, so we could physically be located in a jurisdiction, which would then create this link between the government and the taxpayer, right? If you as an individual live in Lawrence, then you are subject to Lawrence jurisdiction because you have physical presence in Lawrence. If Amazon has a warehouse, you know, in, I don't know, Shawnee or Overland Park or wherever, then there is a physical presence that Amazon has that forces Amazon to be under jurisdictions in that area. If the jurisdiction comes from economic presence, you know, an example of this is, let's say Amazon doesn't have a warehouse in an area, but Amazon is still selling goods to consumers in that area, right? Uh, that is creating this economic presence, which is subjecting Amazon to jurisdictions in that area. So Amazon might not necessarily have a warehouse in you know, I don't know, Lawrence, but because Amazon is selling to people that are living in Lawrence, then Amazon is subject to Lawrence jurisdiction because of economic presence. And then citizenship, it's, uh, it's just due to the fact that, you know, you were born in a country. You're either a U.S. citizen or you're a, you know, German citizen or, a, or, or an Italian citizen or whatever, and each country has different rules for its citizens on how they pay taxes. Uh, but when we speak about the U.S. government specifically, our federal government has the power to tax U.S. citizens, right? And our government taxes U.S. citizens regardless of where they live. <clears throat> so you could be living in the US, right, in any of the states or territories, or you could be living outside of the US in any other country in the world, you are still subject to US jurisdiction. And you are taxed on worldwide income. So after you graduate, you could get a job in Paris, and you could be living in France. You know, you have no connections with the U.S. aside from the fact that you're a U.S. citizen. You're living and working in Paris, but because you are a U.S. citizen, you would still need to pay taxes on the income that you earn in France. Now, there are certain rules that govern how much taxes you pay, but you are still subject to U.S. jurisdiction. Uh, similarly, the U.S. government taxes uh, resident aliens. And once again, this is regardless of where they live. And they are taxed on world 
worldwide income. So you could be a German citizen, right? You were born in Germany and then you immigrated here and now you have a US green card. So you are legally able to live and work in the United States, but you decided to go back to Germany because you have a US green card, because you are a resident alien, you would still owe taxes on the income that you earn from your job in Germany. Uh, once again, there are different rules that govern how much you would pay or if you would pay at all, but technically you would still be subject to US federal jurisdiction. And finally, the US federal government also taxes non-resident aliens. However, they are only sourced, I mean only taxed, on US income. So let's say you're a German citizen and you have a visa that allows you to live and work in the US but you're not a resident alien, you don't hold a green card. You would still be paying taxes on the income you earn within the United States. If you move outside of the United States in that case then you would not owe any taxes. So because of you know either physical presence or citizenship, the U.S. federal government has jurisdiction over you. Uh, one of the properties of taxes that we had talked about, if you remember, is that taxes are pervasive, right? So when we said, you know, taxes are pervasive, we said that taxes are widespread and they have many different varieties. The other property was that taxes were dynamic, they change frequently. But uh, because of the pervasive nature of taxes, there are many, many different types of taxes, right? So one big one is federal and state income taxes. Another tax that we're all subject to are sales taxes. If we buy anything in most states and cities, we will be paying a tax on what we purchase. Another type of tax is a property tax. If you're a property owner, you pay a tax on that property that you own. Uh, we also have state taxes. These are also known as the death tax. So when you die, if you are extremely wealthy, right? There's some very generous limitations on this tax, so it doesn't apply to a vast majority of the taxpayers. But if you are extremely wealthy and you transfer that wealth to the next generation, you will pay a slight tax on that wealth. There are social security taxes that are taken out of our paycheck every pay period, right? So these are all different types of taxes that we are subject to depending on which jurisdiction we're under. You know, some jurisdictions don't have a property tax, some jurisdictions have a high property tax, some jurisdictions don't exercise a sales tax, some states don't have income taxes, but this just goes back to the pervasive nature of taxes. There are so many different types of taxes that affect our lives, right? Now, two properties of tax that we said, they were dynamic and they were pervasive, and each tax that we talk about has this basic structure. The tax equals the rate times the base. Uh, now the easier thing to talk about here, which is what we're going to talk about first, is the base. Right? The base is anything that can be taxed. So this is the scope of the tax. Right, so if we're talking about an income tax, then your income makes up the base of that tax. If we're talking about a tax on cigarettes, then, you know, a carton of cigarettes is the base of that tax. So the scope of the tax makes up the base. The rate, we can have different types of rate. We can have a flat rate. in which case a single rate applies to all bases, 
right? So this could be something like, you know, a gasoline tax, regardless of how much gas you buy, whether it's one gallon or a hundred gallons, you have a, I'm just making this up, like a 20 cent per gallon gasoline tax, right? This is a flat rate. Or we could have a graduated rate. And this is differing percentages to differing brackets. Right? So the federal income tax rate has a gradu is a graduated rate. You know, if you're making X amount to X amount, you're paying 10%. But if you're making X amount to X amount, then you're paying 12%. And if you're making this amount to that amount, then you're paying 20% and so on and so forth. That's a graduated rate. But on the other hand, a sales tax, for instance, has a flat rate. I think in Lawrence, we pay about like a 9.1% sales tax. And that doesn't matter whether we shop, you know, 10 bucks at the grocery store or we spend a thousand dollars, you know, buying clothes and shoes and whatever. So base is anything that can be taxed. It's the scope of the tax and the rate is what we multiply by the rate base and it could be a flat rate or it could be a graduated rate. Uh, and a government can increase revenue increase revenue by either increasing the rate or the base. So essentially the government has two levers that it can pull, right? It can pull a rate lever and change rates in order to increase revenue, right? So the government can say, hey, instead of like a 20 cent per gallon tax on gasoline, we now want to have a 30 cent per gallon tax rate on gasoline and that is a manipulation of the rate in order to raise revenue or the government can increase the base right the government can say hey sales tax doesn't apply to these items I don't know like medicine if you buy medicine prescription medicine you don't pay a sales tax but then if they want to raise additional revenue they can say well we want to increase the base of this tax we want to increase the scope so now we're including medicine in the taxable base right so the government can raise revenue by pulling on either handle. They could pull on the rate handle, they could pull on the base handle, they could pull on both handles at the same time. But the important thing to note is that there is a trade-off, right? Uh, there is a trade-off. If the government decides to increase the rate and the rate is too high, suddenly the base might decrease, right? If the sales tax jumps up from being 9% to 15%, then individuals might decide not to shop as much and that would decrease the base. If the tax, tax on gasoline goes up from, you know, once again made up figures here, like 20 cents a gallon to a dollar a gallon, people might not drive as much, so the increase in the rate ends up shrinking the base, right? So there are trade-offs uh, that the government needs to be cognizant of or the taxing authority needs to be aware of. Now, we talked about how rates can be flat or graduated. Uh, when we talk about rate structure in more detail, uh, we could have a progressive rate, which is higher tax rates for higher base levels. <clears throat> so most graduated tax rates are going to be progressive, meaning that if you earn, you know, X dollars to XX dollars, you're going to pay 10%. If you earn XX dollars to XXX dollars, you're going to pay 20%. And if you earn XXX dollars, to XXXX dollars, you're going to pay 30% and so on and so forth. This is a progressive rate structure because as the amount you earn increases, the tax rate also increases. 
right? As our base increases, so does the tax rate associated with that base. A proportional tax is not a graduated tax rate. This is just a flat tax. Remember, we talked about it back here. It's a flat rate, meaning that same rate applies to all base levels, right? A good example here is a sales tax. Regardless of what we buy, whether we go to Best Buy and get a TV for, you know, $2,000 or we go to Popeye's and get a chicken sandwich for, you know, six, seven dollars, we're paying the same tax rate regardless of the base. So this is a flat tax. A progressive tax, like we said, as we increase the base, we also increase the rate. A good example of this is an income tax. Right? And we kind of laid out an example of the income tax here. A regressive rate is something that we don't generally run into, but it's, you know, something to think about. A lower rate applies to higher base levels. So this is a tax that doesn't generally exist because it seems quite unfair, right? I mean, it would be kind of like flipping this example on its head, the income tax example, right? So if you earn X to XX, you would be taxed at 30%. And on the other end, if you earn XXX to XXXX, you would be taxed 10%. But, you know, that's an example of our base is getting larger, but the rate is getting smaller. And it's not something that we see quite often. Another classification of taxes is that they can be transaction-based or activity-based. Uh, so a transaction-based tax is triggered by a particular event. All right? So there's an event that takes place that triggers that uh, tax and this tax could be avoidable right so an example of this is a sales tax this tax is triggered because you buy something and if you want to avoid this tax you just don't buy something right or like an excise tax an excise tax is triggered because you buy a certain good like cigarettes or beer or liquor right when you buy liquor you pay an excise tax if you want to avoid this tax you just don't buy liquor or beer or cigarettes or gasoline whatever so these taxes are triggered by a particular event a transaction and they are avoidable on the other hand we have activity based taxes and these are imposed on ongoing activities uh, so one example of this is state and federal income taxes, right? We are working, and the fact that we're working, it's an ongoing activity, means that we're receiving a wage, and that wage is then taxed. So it's not a specific transaction that is triggering the state and income tax. We're just subject to the state and income tax because we are working in this ongoing activity. And in most cases, these taxes aren't avoidable. I mean, obviously, if you're not working, you're not paying a tax, but you still need to fill out a tax return. If you are, you know, working, then there's no way to avoid this tax. However, the transaction-based tax is triggered by a specific event, and you can avoid paying the tax if you avoid that event altogether. Now, <clears throat> there is a tax called an earmarked tax, and earmarked taxes are taxes for which the revenues are directly linked to certain government expenditures. So if you remember the first slide, we talked about the difference between a tax and a fee as being the fact that a tax doesn't entitle you to any services. The government chooses how to utilize their tax money as it sees fit. Uh, the difference between you know normal taxes and earmarked taxes is once again with an earmarked tax, you're not able to utilize you're not able to make a decision regarding how the government utilizes your tax money. However, earmarked taxes are 
specifically assigned for a certain pur purpose, right? So property taxes that you pay are earmark taxes because they fund public schools in your area and they fund, you know, public services in your area. So fire department gets property tax money. The police department gets property tax money. Public schools get property tax money. So while I, as a taxpayer, am still not able to make a choice regarding how my tax money is used, I do know that the property taxes that I pay go into the public schools and you know public services in my area. Once again, the taxing authority determines the split. So I can't say, hey, I want all my money going to the police department and not to the fire department or to the public school and not to the police department. But the, uh, the government itself will make that determination. Uh, payroll taxes, they are taken out of your paycheck periodically and they go to fund the Social Security program the Medicare and the Medicaid programs, right? So payroll taxes and property taxes are two types of taxes that are earmarked. So this is just a quick example of my property tax payments, right? These are my very own property tax payments for fiscal year 2019. And as you can see, this is the amount that I've paid. And this amount is going to fund the public schools in my area and the public services in my area. Once again, I have no authority over how the money is distributed between those, you know, options, but uh, at the very least, I know that they're staying local. So up to now, we've talked about a lot of terminology and, and, and different types of taxes. Uh, let's briefly touch on the history of taxation in the U.S. So taxation in colonial America first started with import-export duties and excise taxes on products such as sugar, tobacco, flour, salt, beer, etc. So whatever the colonists here were producing and selling, they were paying taxes on those sales to the British Crown. And the Stamp Act required colonists to buy a government issued stamp for legal documents and other goods. All right, so this was also a type of taxation where you would need to pay the crown to get a book of stamps which you could then use to get legal documents or other goods that were coming over from England. And obviously as you know if you if you've taken US history you know that the 13 colonies united in their opposition against the British Parliament uh, primarily due to the taxation that was uh, coming from the British crown. Uh, so after independence, we drafted the Articles of Confederation, which, you know, was a loose confederation of states. And during the Articles of Confederation, a vast majority of the power rested with the state governments, uh, where, you know, the federal government had no authority uh, to levy taxes, it could only request money from the state governments. However, even though it couldn't levy taxes, it still dealt with diplomacy. Oh man, that is really ugly. Okay, it still dealt with foreign diplomacy and defense. So we had a federal government that was very powerless, right? It couldn't raise any revenue, but it had all these expenditures as it pertained to defending the confederation of states as well as you know dealing with foreign nations so in order to fund these expenses they had to request funding from the states which you know was quite ineffective inefficient and the US Constitution 
gave more power to the federal government to levy taxes. So, you know, this argument that uh, taxation is theft or that, uh, you know, the government doesn't have authority to impose taxes, to levy taxes, is, is not true because Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 of the Constitution gives the federal government power to collect taxes, right? It says, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. So, you know, there couldn't be any regional favoritism in terms of taxing an area less or taxing another area more federally, but the federal government does, in fact, have the power to levy taxes. Now, you know, another key event in U.S. history is obviously the Civil War, and the Civil War was extremely costly. Uh, the Union government needed more revenue. And because of this, it increased tariff rates throughout the war, it issued bonds and treasury notes, and it also enacted the first income tax in 1861. And this was an income tax of 3% on income above 800. So it was a flat rate, right? It was 3% regardless of the base, as long as the base was above $800. And then we had the Internal Revenue Act of 1862, which altered the structure. And the first $600 were exempt from taxation. Then between $600 and $10,000 of income, you paid 3%, and anything above $10,000, you paid 5%. So it was a graduated rate, uh, and the base was all income you earned. And for the first 600, you didn't know anything. Between 600 and 10,000, you owed 3%, and above 10,000, you owed 5%. So that's what the union did, right? The union in, in, in implemented an income tax. Uh, the Confederate government tried to avoid taxes uh, by funding the war effort by printing money. And if you know anything about basic economics, the more money that you print, the less valuable your money becomes. So this led to inflation in the South. And when inflation became a problem, the Confederacy also had to implement an income tax in 1863. Uh, then post-Civil War, we had the William Gorman Tariff, which was the first federal income tax post-Civil War, and it was a 2% tax on income above $4,000. And then we have this court case, Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust Company in 1895, which ruled that the William Gorman Tariff of 1894 was unconstitutional because it favored certain types of income over other types of income and it violated uh, the fact that, you know, certain types of income should not be favored over other types of income. So then we have the 16th Amendment of the Constitution that says the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived. 
without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. And this was passed by Congress on July of 1909 and it was ratified by the states in 1913. And after it was ratified in 1913, it established this tax system, right? So at the time, any income up to 20,000 was taxed at 1%. Any income above 20,000 up to 50,000 was taxed at 2%. Above 50,000 to 75,000 was taxed at 3%. Above 75,000 to 100,000 was taxed at 4%, and so on and so forth, right? So these are 1913 dollars and this is what it would convert to adjusting for inflation in 2010 right so as you can see it was a very low tax rate if you made four hundred forty thousand dollars you would only pay a one percent tax currently we're dealing with this income tax bracket right uh, we have 10%, 12%, 22%, 24%, 32%, 35%, 37%, and 37%. And the bases that are subject to taxation differ depending on whether we're talking about unmarried single individuals, married individuals, or heads of household. So this is basically the first half of chapter one. Uh, in the next video, we'll wrap up chapter one, and at the end of the next video, uh, you will have enough to complete uh, the first quiz. Uh, once again, I'll be available for you online through Zoom at that Zoom meeting ID from 1 to 4 p.m. on Mondays and you know 1 to 5 p.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, have a great day.